Welcome to Americana Archives. Today's headline is The Confessions of a Holdup Man. The introduction says, The Confessions of a Holdup Man, taken from the manuscript of one of the most daring and successful criminals of his class, are of particular interest at this time. In view of the numerous holdups, burglaries, and crimes of a similar nature that are occurring almost nightly throughout the city, this man, known as Tom Talmadge, is one of the most notorious burglars and highwaymen the country has produced. His Bertillon photograph is in the rogues' gallery at police headquarters of every city. His real identity, hidden behind a list of aliases as long as one's arm, is not known. Talmadge has operated in cities from Maine to California, from Canada to the Mexican Gulf. He has served sentences in penal institutions scattered over a territory equally as broad. He is at present a free man, engaged in writing his autobiography. Talmadge is regarded by police officials everywhere as the best operator in his line. He has made a deep study of his work, and he is thoroughly educated in all criminal matters. A phrenological study of his head has developed the fact that it is that of the perfect criminal type. The story says, I consider myself an artist and far above the bungling coarse work of a porch climber, burglar, or bank wrecker. The holdup holds the best job in the whole list. The other fellows had to work for a living. For days and days, they will spot a house and watch the habits of the inmates. At least 19 out of every 20 places spotted, they will find it poor game or impossible for some reason or other. And spotting is hard work too. And even after everything is ready, look at the work. It's like the tree chopper in the forest compared with the delicate strokes of the engraver's tool. And the danger, too, is much greater than street work. A man or woman hearing a strange noise in the house will think of a gun first thing and begin blazing away just from sheer fright. On the street, the holdup stands no such chances. It's almost like taking candy from a baby. Only the victim is too scared to cry. If I could get into a crowd of a hundred men and women and round them up without danger of outside interference for a few minutes, I could lift the whole crowd and get away with the goods just as easily as I have hundreds of times relieved individuals or smaller parties. The spasm of fear seems to grow within itself the more persons there are to handle. One man scared speechless will give it to the others as if by contagion. In an instant, all are speechless and 200 hands point heavenward. And more than that, the active mind in the victim seems to go entirely blank, and the passive take possession of the functions. This is the only reason I can see for the most phenomenal manifestations that follow. I don't believe every man whom I have held up deliberately lied afterward in telling his experience, but not one of them told the truth. An Effort at Reform Once, right here in Indianapolis too, I remember I was down on my luck, way down in fact. I was hungry and cold, and the world didn't look good to me. On account of a little experience with the courts, and later the penitentiary, I decided to brace up and reform. But reformation comes mighty hard with an empty stomach and legs trembling from the chilly weather. I was going from door to door, looking for something to eat, when my eye caught the gleam of a revolver barrel and an ash can. I pulled it out, and found it was a discarded pistol with the lock broken and the cylinder so badly rusted it would not revolve. It was a sign from hell, I suppose, for it was the one thing that drove me back into the profession. In an instant, I was no longer my former self. The hunger and shivering disappeared, and I knew that before morning I would be warm and well-fed. I could no more resist that message from the occult world than I could fly, and at it I went. Within an hour, I had my man spotted, and as he went home soon after dark, I followed. I was afraid he would take a car and leave me behind, for I did not have even the nickel to pay my car fare. But the fates who had put the gun in my hands willed otherwise, and I walked after the man in a very happy spirit, for I am a fatalist and knew that I could not possibly lose. I think it was just at the rear of one of your north side churches where I prepared for the stroke. I walked up and pulled the old gun and quietly ordered, hands up. I pulled at the trigger, and the sound of the rasping of the rusty metal must have driven spikes into that man's coffin, for he tried so hard to grab the clutch a hitching post that stood nearby that I believe he dislocated his shoulder. I lifted all that that man had, and in an instant I was gone. It was just about the easiest money I had ever secured. 
Next morning, I was walking around town with a new suit of clothes and a smooth-shaven face and feeling happy. I wanted to go to Cincinnati and had money enough to pay my fare. In fact, if I had not, I certainly should not have left town. For about the first place the police look for robbers is in the freight yards and on all outgoing trains. They watch the blind baggage too, so the best thing a fellow can do is to make the acquaintance of some drummer who's going out and offer to check his excess baggage on your ticket for half the regular rates. You can always get this information from the hotel clerks. Then you can walk up to the baggage room in the station and check out a big trunk. And if the best detective in the world stood at your side, he would not suspect you. Well, that morning, I walked into the railroad office and almost the first person I ran into was the man of the night before. He was telling a couple of fellows how he had battered and bruised a robber the night before and had him down and was holding him until an officer or help should arrive. Before help came, however, he said somebody hit him with a brick and dazed him and in an instant, the robber had escaped. No, I didn't lose a cent, not even my temper, the fellow was saying, and I almost shouted with laughter and actually bumped into him as I passed out with my ticket in my hand. That fellow never knew how he might have had me. I believe if a man should quietly refuse to put up his hands and start to talk to me, he would scare me half to death. I would know in an instant that the best thing to do would be to pick the easiest and quickest avenue of escape. In a holdup, in my opinion, it's bound to be one or the other badly scared, and if the victim won't ruffle up, the robber is sure to go to pieces for he can never tell what may be behind the confidence the man shows in himself. A case in point is the one that happened to me a few months ago. I held up a man and his wife just as they were about to open the door of their home. I didn't know at the time they were so near home, or I certainly should not have started the play. A man too close to his home is apt to get hysterical. But in this case, the two were completely dazed the moment I ordered their hands up. They couldn't even think and I took all the time I wanted to get their trinkets and cash. They actually thought I had an army behind me, for they afterward told the police I had several companions, and they were certain they could identify at least one. Why, they were so badly scared, they couldn't identify themselves. But I have noticed one peculiar thing about this identifying matter. While the victim is scared speechless, he sometimes unconsciously gets a mental photograph of the robber that comes to the surface of the brain, days and even weeks after the event. But the day after, never. The victim's egotism or something works up his imagination until the robber seems to be eight feet tall and have horns flashing green and yellow flames. I have always been amused at the published descriptions of myself. I do not recall a single instance in which my probable weight was given at less than 180 pounds. I weighed just 130. The same thing occurred when I stuck up a saloon on West Washington Street. I walked in quietly and called for a drink. While the bartender turned his back to draw the beer, I pulled the gun and ordered hands up. There were four men in the saloon at the time, and with the bartender, ten hands went up instantly. While I was going through the men, and they were lined up at the wall, another fellow walked in. He stood still a moment as if in doubt, and then took his place along the waxworks exhibit. I emptied the cash register and backed out and walked around the block. And the next day, I read another account of the bravery of the victims. And now let me explain a psychological fact. Had I gone into the saloon and at once ordered up all hands, I would certainly have received a bullet or two, for two of the men were armed and the bartender had an ugly-looking weapon near the till. But I walked in without the least hesitation. I tried to think of something pleasant, for had I put my mind on the holdup, something might have communicated a feeling of uneasiness to the victims. I have tried it a dozen times, and it's a positive fact that by some telepathic means, the holdup is apt to give himself away, and can then only order and pay for his drink and get out, and hear some fellows say, I don't like that man's eye. But when you keep your mind off business, and think of eating turkey or drinking champagne, and quietly saunter up to the bar, without looking at the hangers-on in the place, they will at once subside and renew their discussion of politics or the latest prize fight. Then keep your eye on the bartender. At the proper moment, make up your mind quickly and give the order, and up will go the hands. The Heroic Victims Another strange thing about the holdup business is the heroism displayed by the victims. To illustrate, Several months ago, I stopped a man near the library. He was a strapping big fell and must have weighed over 200 pounds. He was built like a fighter and was undoubtedly an athlete. 
I spotted him at a nearby drugstore, and he appeared to be a man with calm, cool judgment and not easily rattled. He wore a charm with a huge diamond center, and I was up against it and needed that stone. It was the most promising strike I had seen for several weeks. So I waited a few minutes, and right in front of the library entrance I stopped him. Well, you never saw such a scared man in all your life. He actually trembled, and his knees gave way, and the fellow would have fallen had I not pushed him up against the building and braced him up. I lifted the watch, chain and diamond charm, and also a big wad of bills, and was about to leave when the fellow mechanically reached inside his vest and pulled out a wallet filled with the long green. I grabbed it and then backed off and dodged down an alley. In about five minutes, I was back again on the street, about a block away, and do you know, the fellow was just coming to his senses. In a saloon about an hour later, I heard some guys talking about the holdup, and they explained that the big fellow had hit the first robber and probably killed him that several other robbers then came up, and while one carried the body away, others tackled the big man, who fought them off, and in the scuffle, his watch and chain were torn off and lost, and that the robbers were finally put to fight. The next day, there was an equally ridiculous story in the papers, and I just howled with amusement. That fellow, who had been scared absolutely stiff the night before, had developed the most wonderful imagination I ever heard of, and the way the robbers must have been knocked around, according to his story, was simply cruelty to human beings. The same thing has happened scores of times, and I could tell instances by the dozen where the big fellows developed into heroes next day, but would have put up a good line of business for comic opera while under fire. How to resist a holdup You want to know how to resist a holdup successfully? Well, in the first place, don't get excited. Make up your mind now and frequently hereafter that you had the power and not the robber. Think of this as often as possible and engraft it on your mind so it will act voluntarily at the right time. It's a fact, and you need not think you were trying to believe the impossible. Then, when the holdup man stops you, make a quick grab with the left hand for the collar or the lapel of his coat. Step to the right and jerk the holdup to your left with your left hand. At the same time, give a swinging blow in the small of the back with all your strength with your right fist and follow the blow with a steady push. At the same time, give a sudden push with the left hand and you'll have your victim in a heap. If he has a gun, the quick motions will keep him from discharging it with more than slight possibility of hitting you. More than likely, the ball will go to the ground or strike him in the leg. If the play comes just right to first grab the robber's right wrist in which he has a gun, do so quickly and turn your back. Pull the wrist and arm over your shoulder and then try to throw the robber over your head like a sack of wheat. You will probably hear the fellow's arm snap and break, and if you have strength enough to throw him, you may fracture his skull, but you have the advantage of having him at your mercy and helpless. If you are carrying a cane or a stick, don't try to swing it around your head and brain the fellow. If he knows his business, he will take a step forward, and you may break your arm over his shoulder. The way to do it is to make a quick upward push with all your might, trying to run the end of your stick into the fellow's face. That will do the business in an instant, and if you put a little force into the push, the robber will think of going into a Sunday school and getting a class of children to teach. Under the present circumstances, he is a sure thing, but let him change his methods and his control over the scared and speechless victims is certain to wane, and then he might as well go out of business. But the professional's worst enemy is booze and women. If he could steer clear of them, he would soon get so rich he could retire. I believe I could make a million dollars in two years if I could avoid the foam and the fairies. It's the old story. This story came from the great state of Alabama, being reported in the Mobile Daily Item of April 8, 1905. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, And remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.